The Call of the Wild, Chapter 2. The Law of Club and Fang. Buck's first day on the day, die, die a Beach was like a nightmare. Every hour was filled with shock and surprise. He had been suddenly jerked from the heart of civilization and flung into the heart of things primordial, primordial like caveman type stuff. No lazy, sun-kissed life was this, with nothing to do but loaf and be bored. Here was neither peace nor rest, nor a moment's safety. All was confusion and action, and every moment life and limb were in peril. There was imperative need to be constantly alert, for these dogs and men were not town dogs and men. They were savages, all of them, who knew no law but the law of club and fang. <clears throat> He'd never seen dogs fight as these wolfish creatures fought, and his first experience taught him an unforgettable lesson. It is true, it was a, it was a vicarious experience, um, happened instantaneously, vicarious. Else he would not have lived to profit by it. Curly was the victim. They were camped near the log store, where she, in her friendly way, made advances to a husky dog the size of a full-grown wolf, though not half so large as she. There was no warning, only a leap in, the, in like a flash, <clears throat> a metallic clip of teeth, a leap out of equally swift, and Curly's face was ripped open from eye to jaw. It was the wolf manner of fighting, to strike and leap away. But there was more to the, it than this. Thirty or forty huskies ran to the spot and surrounded the combatants in an intent and silent circle. Buck did not comprehend that silent intentness, nor the eager way with which they were licking their chops. Curly rushed her antagonist, who struck again and leaped aside. He met her next rush with his chest in a peculiar fashion that tumbled her off her feet. She never regained them. This was what the onlooking huskies had waited for. They closed in upon her, snarling and yelping, and she was buried, screaming with agony beneath the bristling mass of bodies. So sudden was it, and so unexpected, that Buck was taken aback. He saw Spitz run out with scarlet tongue in a way he had of laughing, and he saw Francois swinging an axe spring into the mess of dogs. Three men with clubs were helping him to scatter them. It did not take long. Two minutes from the time Curly went down, the last of her assailants were clubbed off, but she lay there, limp and lifeless, in the bloody trampled snow, almost literally torn to pieces, the swart half-breed standing over her and cursing horribly. The scene often came back to Buck to trouble him in his sleep, so that was the way. No fair play. Once down, that was the end of you. Well, he would see to it that he never went down. Spitz ran out his tongue and laughed again. And from that moment, Buck hated him with a bitter and deathless hatred. Before he had recovered from the shock caused by the tragic passing of Curly, he received another shock. Man, we were just getting good friends with Curly. <coughs> <coughs> Francois fastened upon him an arrangement of straps and buckles. It was a harness such as he had seen the grooms put on his, the horses at home. And as he had seen horses work, so he was set to work, hauling Francois on a sled to the forest that fringed the valley and returning with a load of firewood. Though his dignity was sorely hurt by thus being made a draft animal, he was too wise to rebel. He buckled down with a will and did, not, did his best though it was all new and strange. Francois was stern, demanding instant obedience, and by virtue of his whip, receiving instant obedience, while Dave, who was an experienced wheeler, nipped Buck's hind quarters whenever he was in error. Spitz was the leader, likewise experienced, and while he could not always get at Buck, he growled sharper proof now and again, or cunningly threw his weight and traces to jerk Buck into the way he should go. Buck learned easily, and under the combined tuition of his two mates and Francois, made remarkable progress. Ere they, re ere they returned to camp, he knew enough to stop at Ho, to go ahead at Mush, to swing wide on the bends, and to keep clear of the wheeler when the loaded sled shot downhill at their heels. Oh yeah, because the sled would probably go faster than them when they're going downhill. That would be, that would be tough. Twer ver, good dogs, Pierre told Peralt. Dat buck, him pull like hell. I teach him quick, 
As anything, by afternoon, Peralt, who was in a hurry to be on the trail with his dispatches, returned with two more dogs, Billy and Joe, he called them, two brothers and true huskies both, sons of the one mother, though they were, they were as different as day and night. Billy's one fault was his excessive good nature, while Joe was very opposite, sour and introspective, with a perpetual snarl and a malignant eye. Buck received them in, com in comradely fashion. Dave ignored them, while Spitz proceeded to thrash first one and then the other. Billy wagged his tail appeasingly, turned to run when he saw that appeasement was of no avail, and cried, still appeasingly, when Spitz's sharp teeth scored his flank. But no matter how Spitz circled, Joe whirled around on his heels to face him, mane bristling, ears laid back, lips writhing and snarling, jaws clipping together as fast as he could snap, and eyes diabolically gleaming, the incarnation of belligerent fear. So terrible was his appeasant appearance that Spitz was forced to forego disciplining him, but to cover his own discom discomfiture, 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 huh, discomfit, sure. He turned upon the inoffensive and wailing Billy and drove him to the confines of the camp. By evening, Peralt secured another dog, an old husky, long and lean and gaunt, with a battle-scarred face and a single eye which flashed a warning of prowess that commanded respect. He was called Solix, which means the angry one. Like Dave, he asked nothing, gave nothing, expected nothing, and when he marched slowly and deliberately into their midst, even Spitz left him alone. He had one peculiarity which Buck was unlucky enough to discover. He did not like to be approached on his blind side. Of this offense, Buck was unwitting guilty, and the first knowledge he had of his indiscretion was when Solex whirled upon him and slashed his shoulder to the bone for three inches up and down. Forever, after Buck avoided his blindside, and to the last of their comradeship, had no more trouble. His only apparent ambition, like Dave's, was to be left alone. Though as Buck was afterward to learn, each of them possessed one other and even more vital ambition. That night, Buck faced the great problem of sleeping. The tent, illuminated by a candle, glowed warmly in the midst of the white plain, and when he, as a matter of course, entered it, both Peralt and Francois bombarded him with curses and cooking utensils till he recovered from his consternation and fled ignominiously into the outer cold. A chill wind was blowing that nipped him sharply and a bit with a special venom into the, his wounded shoulder. He lay down on the snow and attempted to sleep, but the frost soon drove him shivering to his feet. Miserable and disconsolate, he wandered about among the many tents, only to find that one place was as cold as another. Here and there, savage dogs rushed upon him, but he bristled his neck hair and snarled, for he was learning fast, and they let him go his way unmolested. Finally, an idea came to him. He would return and see how his own teammates were making out. To his astonishment, they had disappeared. Again, he wondered about wandered about through the great camp looking for them and again he returned where they were they in the tent no that could not be else he would not have been driven out then where could they possibly be with drooping tail and shivering body very forlorn indeed he aimlessly circled the tent suddenly the snow gave way beneath his forelegs and he sank down something wriggled under his feet he sprang back bristling and snarling fearful of the unseen and unknown but a friendly little yelp reassured him, and he went back to investigate. A whiff of warm air ascended to his nostrils, and there, curled up under the snow in a snug ball, lay Billy. He whined placatingly, squirmed and wriggled to show his goodwill and intentions, and even ventured as a bribe for peace to lick Buck's face with his warm, wet tongue. Another lesson. So that was the way they did it. Eh? Buck confidently selected a spot and with much fuss and wasted effort proceeded to dig a hole for himself in a trice the heat from his body filled the confined space and he was asleep the day had been long and arduous and he slept soundly and comfortably though he growled and barked and wrestled with bad dreams Aww. so they bury themselves in the snow make a little like dog igloo nor did he open his eyes till roused by the noises of the waking camp at first, he did not know where he was. It, 
had snow during the night and he was completely buried. The snow walls pressed him on every side and a great surge of fear swept through him. The fear of the wild thing for the trap. It was a token that he was harking back through his own life to the lives of his forebears. For he was a civilized dog, an unduly civilized dog, and of his own experience knew no trap and so could not of himself fear it. The muscles of his whole body contracted spasmatically and instinctively the hair on his neck and shoulders stood on end and with a ferocious snarl he bounded straight up into the blinding day the snow flying about him in a flashing cloud ere he landed on his feet he saw the white camp spread out before him and knew where he was and remembered all that had passed from the time he went for a stroll with manuel to the hole he had dug for himself the night before a shout from francois hailed his appearance what I say, the dog driver cried to Peralt. Dat buck for sure learn quick as anything. Peralt nodded gravely as courier for the Canadian government bearing important dispatches. So like mailman. He was anxious to secure the best dogs and he was particularly gladdened by the possession of Buck. Three more Huskies were added to the team inside an hour, making a total of nine. And before another quarter of an hour had passed, they were in harness and swinging up the trail toward the Dye Canyon. Buck was glad to be gone, and though the work was hard, he found and did not particularly despise it. He was surprised at the eagerness which animated the whole team and which was communicated to him. But still more surprising was the change wrought in Dave and Salex. They were new dogs, utterly transformed by the harness. All passiveness and unconcern had dropped from them. They were alert and active, anxious that the work should go well, and fiercely irritable with whatever, with whatever, by delay or confusion, retarded that work. The toil of the traces seemed to supreme, ex seemed the supreme expression of their being and all that they lived for, and the only thing in which they took delight, Dave was Wheeler, or Sled Dog, Pulling in front of him was Buck. Then came Solex. The rest of the team was strung out ahead, single file to the leader, which position was filled by Spitz. <laughs>